All right. Ba -ba -ba, waiting for the stream to catch up. Oh, I should change the settings so there's less latency. So I have to um, sit around waiting for things to start. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, or afternoon, evening, wherever it is where you are. Uh, today, we are probably going to finish this paper, which, oh, can I make this go away? Shoo. Shoo. Okay, well, I guess that's just not going to go away, um, and I'll deal with that later. Uh, I installed a, um, a extension to uh, download forms, and now it's there. Uh, good morning, Gutham and Jer. Uh, welcome. So we haven't looked at this paper in three weeks uh, because we had two weeks ago, it was the um, multimodal translation paper uh, that was live at Kaggle Days in San Francisco. And then last week was CareerCon. And in this time slot, we were talking about APIs. Um, and now uh, we can finally get back into it. Uh, and I genuinely don't remember where we were. Uh, I should have looked it up. Uh, so the um, idea of this paper, I also definitely remember. I'm just going to refresh my memory by reading the abstract. Um, so contextual word embeddings are instead of a bag of word model, you keep the position of the sentence. Uh, uh, Ryan says disable. Um, and extensions options. Um, click the button in the right corner to disable the icon next to the Google Drive button. I have clicked it and it looks like, all right. Um, oop. Let's turn you off. Nope. Okay. Well, we can deal with that later. That's fine. Um, so the idea is that, uh, instead of just using a bag of words um, so the you know words that are in a text regardless of their order we keep information about the order um, and then the so that's the idea of contextual word representations and then the sort of the thing that this paper is arguing is that as you go up through the model, you start with uh, representations that are sort of like word or phrase level, and then as you or sort of word or you know two words or whatever, um, and as you go further and further and further up through the architecture, uh, and they're looking at several different architectures, you get more and more and more structural information. Uh, hello, Abiola. Ab Abiola. Uh, all right, and we had, so we definitely talked about the different types of language models. Um, we definitely talked about LSTM, Transformer, Gated CNN, uh, and I believe that this particular, I think this is the research group that did ELMO, um, and they are, uh, their previous work had been in bidirectional LSTM, and they also looked at um, transformers, um, gated CNNs, uh, and then they applied it to a bunch of tasks that we talked about. So I think we'd gotten all the way through named entity recognition, uh, and the sort of trade-off seemed to be that LSTMs were slower but had better performance, and that transformers and CNNs were faster but had sort of like were less good, it seemed, at capturing this um, this sort of uh, larger structural information. Hello, Emmett. Uh, so now they're going to talk about, let's see, part of speech tagging. Okay, we definitely looked at this figure as well. Um, and the... Um, so these are the layers in the model. And the argument here was that um, 
for things that happened at the word layer, lower levels were better. So we had sort of like a slope this way for things that happened um, at the sort of um, phrase level, the middle of the architecture was better. And it's harder to see with the four layer LSTM just because there's fewer layers, but we go from bottom to sort of the, the middle is sort of like a, almost a normal looking distribution um, of the uh, most relevant layers. And then for unsupervised co-reference, so this is sort of a long distance dependency, it's the top layers of the model that are doing the most work. Uh, and we definitely had looked at that. Uh, and did we look at context independent word representation? Mm. No, that's syntactic, semantic. I don't think we looked at table three or figure four. I think we only looked at figure three, um, section 5.3. So we definitely got past that. Um, and let's actually just start with uh, section 5.3. And this may be a little bit of an overlap, but I could use refresh because of that it's been a minute. Uh, so section 5.3, probing contextual information. Uh, in this section, we quantify some of the anecdotal observations made in section 5.1. Uh, to do so, we adopt a series of linear probes, Bell and Cov et al. 2017, with two NLP tasks to test the contextual representations in each model layer for each BILM architecture, bidirectional language model. In addition to examining single tokens, we depart from previous work by examining to what extent span representations capture phrasal syntax. I think we haven't talked about this. Um, linear probes, I am not familiar with, and I'm actually gonna go down and search the, uh, uh, what machine, uh, neural machine translation models learn about morphology. This sounds like a very familiar paper. And I think I was at, um, I think I was at ACL 2017. That was the one in, um, Search, search, why can't I search? There we go. Um, I think that was the one in um, uh, Vancouver. I think I might have seen this paper presented. Uh, Neural machine translation models obtain state of the art performance while maintaining simple end to end architecture. However, little is known about what these models learn about source and target languages. Uh, during the training process. In this work, we analyze representations learned by neural MT models at various levels of granularity and empirically evaluate the quality of representations for learning morphology through extrinsic part of speech and morphological tagging tasks. Um, so, So they are looking at normal machine translation. So this is sort of parallel to the literature in uh, computer vision where you're determining sort of where in the, in the image is most informative. It's sort of a, an interpretation standpoint. Uh, and then they are using neural machine models, neural machine translation models, um, to look at part of speech and morphological tagging. Uh, so part of speech is like verb, uh, noun, uh, adjective, and the morphological tagging uh, is probably tagging each of the each of the morphemes in a word. So cats would be cat, and then s. So cat being a the root that means like you know feline meow, and then s being plural in English. Um, and the thing that I was interested in, oh, video on Vimeo, fascinating. Uh, this must be. Yeah, this is the new the new anthology website that they uh, uh, they launched pretty recently, so that's nice. Uh, but the thing that I was interested in was specifically what these linear probes are. So you're in section five point three. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Connectional similarity. Where is section five point three? Uh, here we go. Uh, linear probes, and I sort of want to get an idea of what's going on there. Okay, they don't call them linear probes. Uh, they use the word probe exactly once. 
All right. Decoder analysis, effects of attention, effects of word representation. I don't really know what they mean here. Um, we investigate how they learn word structure. We evaluate the representation quality on other tasks. So they must just mean that they take a trained model and then used it for a different task. Um, and then they look at jointly learning, so multitask learning for translation and morphology. All right, sorry, that was a bit of a rabbit hole. I'm still not entirely sure what they're doing, um, but maybe if we keep reading, it'll become clearer. Uh, and hello, everybody. Uh, okay. In addition to examining single tokens, we'd also depart from previous work by examining to what extent the span representations capture phrasal syntax. Uh, so single tokens are like words or morphemes. Our results show that all bylam architectures learn syntax, including span-based syntax, and part of speech information is captured at lower layers than constituent structure. When combined with the co-reference accuracies in sections 5.1 that peak at even higher layers, this supports our claim that deep ILMs learn a hierarchy of contextual information. Hmm. So I agree that inherent in language there is a hierarchical structure. I don't know that the fact that different layers are better at different tasks um, entails that there is entails that the model has captured hierarchical information with their relationships to each other, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, let's keep reading and maybe they will, they will offer more evidence. All right, part of speech tagging. Peters et al. 2018, so previous uh, author paper by these authors, showed that the contextual vectors from the first layer of the two-layer LSTM plus a linear classifier were near start state of the art for part of speech tagging. So they have this um, big language model, they take the first two layers and then they just add a linear classifier um, and then they're doing good part of speech tagging. Here we test whether this results hold for other architectures. Uh, the second row of figure three shows tagging accuracies for all layers of the BILMs evaluated with the Wall Street Journal portion of the Penn Tree Bank. Accuracies for, accuracies for all of these models are high, ranging from 97.2 to 97.4 percent, that's pretty good, uh, and follow a single trend with maximum values at lower layers. Okay, so they're just, okay, so the linear probes must just be, we took part of the model and then applied it and see how well it worked. Uh, and if we scroll down to figure, nope, scroll up to figure three, confusing. Uh, or figure four, rather? Oh, no, figure three. Okay, so we already looked at figure three. Uh, bottom layer for LSTM, second layer for transformer, and third layer for CNN. Okay. Um, and this is, uh, apologies for people who are, who are hopping into this one for the first one. We have spent, at this point, four weeks on this paper. Um, so you might want to go back and, and watch the other ones, uh, and we'll, we'll walk through it from the, from the beginning. All right. Constituency parsing. Uh, here, we test whether the span representations introduced in section 5.1 capture enough information to model constituent structure. Um, so constituent structure is some things like, I went to the beach, to the beach is a little, a little chunk. Um, and um, me and my friend went to the beach, me and my friend is a little chunk. So that sort of idea that there's a, a hierarchical relationship between words and there are phrases where the words in that phrase have a closer relationship to each other. It's sort of the very, very, very general uh, description. Uh, our linear model is very simple and independently predicts the constituent type for all possible stands in a sentence using a linear classifier and the span representation all possible spans in a sentence. So they're looking at just like a sentence and then they're looking at all possible words. So I, if I was like, I went to the beach, I went and then went to and to the and the beach and then I went to went to the to the beach and then I went to the and then went to the beach. So I'm, I'm sort of like doing the, the bigger um, opening. Okay. So I'm guessing they're they're detecting whether or not each span is a constituent, and if it is, what type of constituent it is. 
then a valid tree is built with a greedy decoding step that reconciles overlapping spans with an ILP similar to Joshi et al. I don't know what an ILP is. Um, this sounds like parsing stuff. So they're actually getting a model out. Um, so they are doing full on parsing. They're not just sort of detecting spans. Uh, the third row of figure three shows the results. Remarkably, predicting spans independently using the BILM representation alone has an F1 of near 80% for the best layers from each model. For comparison, a linear model using glove vectors performs very for poorly with an F1 of 18.1%. Uh, that makes sense because glove vectors are based on bag of words um, and uh, the context vectors that they're talking about include syntactic information, like it retains the information on order. Um, Ryan says, not sure what they're saying, but it might be cool to train the whole model, then peel off layer by layer, and then train LR or something simple on it and see how different depths perform. Yeah, that definitely would be interesting. Um, I don't, I think they released their code. I think we looked at that last time. Um, so that would definitely be interesting to sort of pick apart. Uh, hello, Alex. Okay, um, so they're saying that if you're using uh, contextual word embeddings, you have information about context. And if you don't have contextual word embeddings, if you just have plain embeddings, you don't have information about context and you can't use them for parsing. And I think that's extremely reasonable. Uh, across all architectures, the layer best suited for constituency parsing are at or above the layers with maximum POS, part of speech, tagging, accuracies as modeling phrasal syntactic structure requires wider context than token level syntax. Um, I definitely agree. I don't think it's necessarily clear a priori that, um, that that would be the case, but this does seem to be what their empirical results suggest. Um, so I'm... I'm down with that. I think this is a really interesting finding. I think that the claims that they've made so far about um, models, ooh, excuse me, models learning hierarchies is a little bit broad. I definitely think it sort of shakes out that way. Um, yeah, anyway, that's, that's my thoughts so far. Uh, similarly, the layers must be transferable to parsing. The layers most transferable to parsing are at or below layers with maximum pronominal co-reference accuracy. Um, so if you are looking at like a paragraph and you're like, we trained the model, it performed well, um, knowing that it and the model refer to the same thing as co-reference. Pronominal co-reference because it is a pronoun. Uh, as constituent structure tends to be more lo local than co-reference, agreed. Um, okay, so they're saying that there's this sort of pattern in language and also there's these patterns in our models and we're suggesting that um, the model is learning the same sort of hierarchical structure as language, the hierarchical structures that exist in language. Um, and that LSTM seem to be best at this task, which also um, mirrors um, other work. I tweeted about it relatively recently um, that shows that LSTMs are better at um, uh, hierarchical tasks, specifically um, inference. Um, so like semantic, um, oh, not inference, not inference, um, <sighs> implicature, uh, semantic implicature. Those of you who had formal logic will be like, oh yeah, I, I remember that from my, my formal logic classes. All right, learned layer weights. So I think this is actually probably the most central paragraph in the entire paper. Um, and I, I buy it. I definitely think that the, the model is capturing the informational structure of language and the way that it works. Um, so I'm, I'm down for that. I don't necessarily know that there is some sort of like uh, hierarchical inference going on in the model. Uh, I think that it just sort of works out this way. Like, I wouldn't say that this model has learned syntax. Uh, I think that's a good way to get yourself yelled at by uh, syntacticians. All right, 5.4, learned layer weights. Figure four plots the softmax normalized layer weights from each BILM learned as part of the tasks in section four. The SRL model weights are omitted as they close to constant since we had to regularize them to stabilize training. What does that mean? The SRL model weights are omitted as they must be, they are close to constants and we had to regularize them to stabilize training. What was SRL? I think that was one of their tasks, right? Uh, 
uh, semantic role labeling. Okay. And I think this was things like uh, agent and patient. Uh, and I do remember going and looking at these. Um, so you might want to go back and, and look at, um, I think, the last video in this series if you were interested. Uh, so they omitted them because they were uh, constant, because they were regularized. Okay. Uh, for constituency parsing, S mirrors the layer-wise linear parsing results with the largest weights near or at the same layer as the maximum linear parsing. Woof. Okay, so for constituency parsing, S, um, which are the soft max normalized layer weights, mirror the layer-wise linear parsing results. Okay, so this is when we took part of the, part of the model um, and then used up to that part of the model to do a task using the the linear uh, linear probing which is not what the authors that they cited called it uh, with the largest weights near or at the same layers as maximum linear parsing uh, largest weights near or at the same layer as multilinear okay so this is instead of sort of like going up through the model this is looking at each each um, layer in the model independently. Uh, for constituency parsing, it's so when we're looking at individual layers, it looks like um, the constituency parsing one looks pretty similar. For both NER and multi NLI, natural language inference, named entity recognition, the transformer focuses heavily on the word embedding layer and the first contextual layer. Um, so that they're saying that for things that are more, I guess that makes sense because NER, so usually NER is a task that's done sort of at the word level. Um, so I might be like, I went to Disneyland and met Goofy. Um, we'd want to pick out Disneyland and Goofy as the named entities in there because those are things with names. Um, and that does tend to be done at the word level. Um, and I forget about multi NLI. Um, uh, AJ says, I'm a little late. Can anyone summarize what's been discussed so far? So we've read from here, <laughs> section, the top of section 5.3, but this is the fourth video in the series. So if you want like a, um, the rest of the paper, you should probably go back and watch the first three. Uh, okay. Da, blah, 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 blah. And the first contextual layer. In all cases, the maximum layer weights occur below the top layers as the most transferable context representations, contextual representations, tend to occur in the middle layers, while the top layers specialize for language modeling. So what they're saying here is that the, so the top layer is language modeling. So sort of what words come next, and this is sort of um, broader, um, co-occurrence and order information uh, and things that are more at the word level or at the phrase level rather than sort of you know the span of language tend to occur lower down in the model. So this is um, additional information that sort of supports um, what they were saying up here. Uh, figure four, which I believe is above here. All right, okay, so here's figure four. Um, all right, and so their argument here is that named entity recognition and uh, natural language inference, uh, the weights with the the layers with the highest weights were further down. Um, so we can see in the transformer, they're right at the bottom. Um, interestingly, in the LSTM, it looks like MNLI is actually above parsing, sort of the, the sweet spot. Uh, and then if we looked at the gated CNN, this is really hard to see. I'm sorry, guys. Can we zoom in? Zoom, zoom, zoom. Uh, the yellow is, um, so this is the parsing. This is sort of like the, the phrase level things. The layers with the weights that are most relevant for that or best performing for that are higher in the model. Uh, and that's true also for the, the transformer. But for... Um, the uh, named entity recognition, it looks like that's more localized towards the bottom of the model. And then MNLI is sort of in the middle-ish of all of these models. Um, so actually, I would like them to talk about the LSTM specifically, because it looks like for the LSTM, uh, the parsing is happening in the lower place in the model than MNLI. And let's actually quickly go back and look at MNLI. Um, just for um, 
for me to remember what the specific task was. Textual entailment annotations. Okay, so I think this was, um, I have gone to the fair. Um, so if I say I went to the fair with Dumbo, I don't know, I guess I've got Disney on the brain. Uh, I went to the fair with Dumbo, then that entails that I did go to the fair and it contradicts that I did not go to the fair. So if it's true that I went to the fair with Dumbo, it is true that I went to the fair. It is not true that I did not go to the fair. And there's no relation for something like Goofy went to the fair because you don't have that information in the first sentence. And I would actually expect that just sort of thinking about um, the hierarchy that we tend to talk about in linguistics, I would expect that to be at a higher level than phrase, uh, phrase level constituency parsing. So I'm actually, I feel like um, for me, this most gels with my intuitions, that sort of like cross sentential argument structure, knowledge, stuff, discourse level things are should be above phrase level constituency parsing. Um, and that it's actually kind of surprising to me that they aren't in the transformer and the CNN, um, which they don't talk about. <laughs> uh, interesting. Yeah, the SRL model. So they didn't do the uh, whatever SRL was. I've forgotten again. Um, SMER is the linear wise linear parsing results, which the largest weights near or at the same layer as maximum linear parsing. Okay. Uh, Transformer focuses heavily on word embedding and the first contextual layer. Yes. All right. So they just don't talk about it much. Um, hmm. Interesting. Uh, I would definitely like to see more discussion here. Uh, but I think their general argument is still upheld, which is that different tasks happen at different layers and that this sort of roughly um, correlates to the ways that we think, we linguists, think about hierarchical language information being structured. Um, Co-reference I definitely think happens sort of above constituency parsing. Um, that makes sense. There's this, so there's, um, when we talk about, and so in linguistics, if you've ever taken intro linguistics, we talk about levels of the grammar, um, and sort of the lowest level thing are in writing character level things, or in speech sound, um, or in sign, sign language parameters, like location or hand shape. Um, and then you sort of go up to words, so, and then morphemes, and then words, and then um, syntactic structures, so phrasal level things, and then discourse level things. Um, so things that happen over the course of a conversation or text. All right, uh, related work. Uh, and they did this thing where, ooh, let me get rid of that. Uh, they did this thing where the related work is at the end, which I hate. I know people do it in like genetics and chemistry, but I, I like it at the top so that I have context for the work. And that's just me. All right. Uh, in addition to BLM-based representations, McCann et al. learned contextualized vectors with a neural machine translation system, COVE. I've definitely heard of those. Uh, however, as Peters et al., same authors as this paper, showed, the BLM-based representations outperformed COVE in all considered tasks. We focus exclusively on BLMs. Okay, so they're saying we're not looking at this because in a previous paper we found that um, these contextualized vectors performed worse than our model, and our model is very good. Uh, they're they're not like being that that sassy, uh, but that's sort of the way that that academic discourse works, especially in machine learning and machine learning related tasks. Um, you show that your model is better, and then you publish a paper that shows that your model is better, and then you can be like, ours is better. So we didn't look at this one um, after the initial phase where you look at it on a specific task. I might still, well, I guess they did train like five models, um, but I still might have tucked this in because it seems very relevant. Um, this also feels like potentially something that a reviewer brought up uh, and then they, they inserted. It's hard to say. All right, uh, Liu et al. 2018 proposed using densely connected RNNs, densely connected RNNs, so not LSTM, uh, and layer pruning to speed up the use of context vectors for prediction. As their method is applicable to other architectures, it could also be combined with our approach. So maybe a further direction. Um, 
interested. So the difference between an LSTM and an RNN is uh, our current neural network sort of can remember everything. Um, an LSTM forgets, so it includes something called a forget gate. So it um, will prioritize more recent things in general. That's sort of the, the general idea. Um, and uh, outside of transformers, uh, bidirectional LSTMs with attention tend to hold state of the art in many, um, uh, many NLP tasks. Um, although I haven't read all the ACL papers uh, or NACL papers that, that were released, so I should probably spend some time with those and make sure that that's still the case. Um, and transformers seem to do well on, um, so transformers are things like BERT. Um, so BERT is a, a language model based on transformer architecture. Uh, GPT-2 is a, no, was GPT-2 a transformer? We read this paper, I don't remember. Anyway, um, so transformers have done well on specific tasks, but they're not sort of like general purpose. Um, they they tend to work well for language modeling and machine translation and beyond that. Uh, yeah. All right, uh, Kamara says, haven't gotten far in NLP. Uh, it was fascinating to go through and try to catch up. Thanks a lot. Oh, thanks for joining. Um, and it's, I mean, NLP is a big field um, and generally people who are, who are working in research have a very narrow specialization within it. So even if you are in NLP, uh, if you're reading a paper outside of your particular area, there's, there's always some catch up. All right. Um, Several prior studies have examined the learned representations in RNNs. Carpathia et al. 2015 trained a character LSTM language model on source code and showed that individual neurons in the hidden state track the beginning and end of code blocks. Oh, I remember this paper. Uh, Linzen, oh, that's Tal's paper, uh, assessed whether RNNs can learn number agreement in subject verb dependencies. And I think the results were kind of, if I remember correctly, uh, our analysis in section 5.1 showed that BILMs also learn number agreement for co-reference. Oh, AJ says GPT-2 used the decoder part of the transformer architecture. Okay, so um, still transformers. Um, sorry, just to, to go back to talk about talk about model architectures. Um, so far, most of the work that I have seen where transformers seem to do you know, pretty well against the, the current state of the art have been in language modeling and um, uh, machine translation, which is the other thing I said. Um, so sort of like things where there's there's output that you, you generate, which isn't always the case. Um, and GPT-2 was their big uh, contribution in that paper was that they used a lot of compute uh, and it did better at some things um, and still not super good at some other things. Um, and they also chose not to release their model, um, which they said was for ethical reasons, um, which I, I never want to uh, shame people for, for doing things for, for ethical reasons. But um, yeah, anyway, that's the, there's a whole, whole set of videos on that. So if you're interested, you can go and check those out. Uh, Kadar et al. 2017 attributed the activation patter patterns, I think that's supposed to be patterns, uh, of RNNs to input tokens and showed that an RNN language model is strongly sensitive to tokens with syntactic functions. Um, so I'm assuming with syntactic, I haven't read this paper, um, syntactic functions here, they mean things like um, uh, function words like to, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know. All words have syntactic functions, so um, yeah, that's sort of a weird way to talk about a paper. Uh, Kamar says, how is BERT performance compared to BILM? So BERT is a BILM. This is a really good question. Uh, BERT is, uh, it stands for bidirectional transformer. <laughs> Um, so BERT is itself a bidirectional language model. Um, it's the, the sort of like contribution is instead of building one model that looks forward and one model that looks backward, it's a transformer model that looks forward and backward at the same time and is sort of trained around a fill in the gap kind of uh, paradigm. Um, so, and it's had pretty good results. It was um, the best paper at NACL. Um, and I actually did a, so on this channel, we've read the paper and we also did uh, an interview with um, 
uh, Jacob Devlin, who is the first paper of the author in the Coffee Chat series. So if you're interested in Bert, we have lots of resources. Uh, tokens with syntactic functions. That's a, that's a weird way to put it, because all words have syntactic functions in language. Uh, Bell and Kov et al. 2017 used linear classifiers to determine whether neural machine translation systems learned morphology and POS tags. Okay, so this is the one we looked at and they sort of use this same idea of a linear classifier at different places in the model to look at the output, which is cool. I really like that. It's a nice way to do sort of like model auditing. Uh, concurrent with other work, uh, Candlewall et al. 2018 studied the role of context in influencing language model predictions. Gaddy et al. 2018 analyzed neural constituency parsers. Blevins et al. 2018 explored whether RNNs trained with several different objectives can learn hierarchical syntax. I feel like we looked at that. Uh, and Kanyu et al. 2018 examined to what extent sentence representations capture linguistics functions. Um, AJ, according to Kumari's question, doesn't BERT primarily use language model fine tuning as opposed to contextualized embeddings? Uh, yes. So it's not. Mm. Yes. So it's not. Let me read the question again. <laughs> Uh, language model fine tuning as opposed to contextualized embeddings. Yes. So language models and contextualized embeddings are kind of can be used in some of the same ways. Um, the idea is that you have sort of this model that has information about um, words that are near each other in some sort of space. Um, in embeddings and then in a language model you have information about what words tend to occur next to each other and sort of like speech output so contextualized embeddings have both of that types of information um, so you could use the system here the system here that they're talking about their bidirectional language models are language models and the contextualized embeddings are sort of like the bottom part of it uh, and then BERT is a language model and again if you took like the sort of the the part of it, you can use it as embeddings, um, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Uh, and Lara says, BERT uses contextualized embeddings, which are fine-tuned for custom task. Yeah, so it's kind of the same thing with a slightly different name. Um, and I, I, like the biggest difference is the, is the model architectures. Uh, anyway, so this is just a bunch of other work that's happening at the same time. Uh, our intrinsic analysis is most similar to Bell and Cobb et al. 2017. However, we probe span representations in addition to word representations, evaluate the transferability of the BILM representations to semantic tasks in addition to syntax tasks, and consider a wider variety of neural architectures in addition to RNNs. So with this, there was this paper that does something pretty similar, but they're saying that we look at phrases in addition to just words. Um, and they look at semantic tasks, so uh, things like named entity recognition, which require you to have some understanding of meaning and world knowledge, uh, in addition to syntax. Uh, our other work is focused on attributing network predictions. Lee et al. 2016 examined the impact of erasing portions of a network's representations on the output, uh, so sort of like an ablation study. Um, Sundar Arajan uh, et al. used a gradient-based method to attribute predictions to input, and Murdoch et al. Murdoch et al. decomposed LSTMs to interpret classification predictions. Uh, gradient-based method to addiction pr attribute predictions to inputs. So this looks like sort of an attention sort of a uh, way of figuring out what input was used for what output, maybe. Uh, in contrast to these approaches, we explore the types of contextual information encoded in the BILM internal states, instead of a focusing on attributing this information to the words in the input sentence. Okay, so they're saying instead of sort of like those models where they go through and they're like, these are the words we used to make this prediction, um, they're saying this is the part of the model that we used to make this prediction, and this is the difference between our work and this work. 
uh, is there any models you'd recommend for topic modeling? I mean, uh, the the classic ones are LDA and TF-IDF, but um, I mean, if you if you have a specialized needs, you're probably going to need to to build your own model. Uh, Leonardo says, I don't think this paper uses BERT. I think technically it just uses the transformer trained like ELMO and GPT. Yes. Um, and I should say that this paper came out before BERT. Um, so it's that is not an oversight by the authors at all. Uh, and actually, I think I think the BERT paper cited this paper. So it's definitely in the same intellectual vein. All right. Conclusions and future work. We have shown that deep ILMs learn a rich hierarchy of contextual information. <sighs> mm. Okay, so there is a hierarchy intrinsic in the information. The model is separating out, so different parts of the model are focusing on different places in the hierarchy. I think that it's pretty... I don't know that this model has actually learned a hierarchical representation. I think that the model architecture and weights reflect the intrinsic hierarchical structure in the data. I don't necessarily know that that entails that it's learned a hierarchy. Does that make sense? Um, so, uh, I'm trying to think of a way that you would test that though, and that seems pretty pretty hard. Uh, so one way that you could sort of test for, well, I guess that's sort of generative. I don't know. I'm trying to come up with a good task for this. Um, and I know just like s watching me sit here and think it's probably not the best, uh, not the best content. Um, but I would want different I would want more evidence to show that there is actually a hierarchy because for me if there's a hierarchy then information from lower in the hierarchy is passed up and information from up above in the hierarchy is passed down um, in a sort of ordered way and I don't know that that's true. Um, Yeah, yeah, I need to take some time to think about this. Um, I also probably would not have been tapped to review this paper because I do not have a, a deep syntax background, so. Um, uh, across all architecture types, the lower BLM layers specialize in local syntactic relationships. Okay. Uh, allowing the higher levels to model longer range relationships such as co-reference and to specialize for the language modeling task of the topmost layers. Uh, these results highlight the rich nature of the linguistic information captured in the BILM's representations and show that BILM's act as a general purpose feature extractor for natural language, opening the way for computer vision style feature reuse and transfer models. Okay, I definitely, it does seem to be extracting features. I'm okay with that. And then the idea that they're proposing here is then you could sub extract the, the NER model part of the architecture and then use that somewhere else. So I guess, I guess what would really um, cement this for me is if the parts of the model really were decomposable and you could take the NER layers and obviously this is a little bit pie in the sky but if you could take sort of like the NER layers and you're suggesting this is learning features about NER or this is this these layers have learned features about um, you know morphological decomposition or these layers have learned features about co-reference if you could take the layers from different models trained on different text in different genres, and then um, sort of do a, a Lego thing. I think that would be very compelling for me. Um, if you showed that shuffling the order of the weights broke the model in an interesting way, I think that would be compelling for me. I think that would suggest that, yes, there is hierarchical information being learned. And if you try to do something higher in the uh, higher in the hierarchy and then something lower in the hierarchy and then something higher in the hierarchy again, that breaks. I think that would be compelling for me. Um, this just seems to be sort of a uh, things that are farther apart show up higher in the model. And I think that that makes sense. Um, 
I think that makes sense to me, but I don't necessarily think that this, I mean, I don't like to use the word prove because um, it's, I mean, that's, the standards of evidence for proof are extremely high. Um, but I think for me, that would be compelling to say that there is a hierarchy that's being broken down by this model. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, other blah, 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 talking about topic modeling um, from the BERT paper. All the BERT results presented have used fine tuning. They seem to treat fine tuning and feature based approaches as different methods. Uh, yeah, I would I would also agree with that. Um, and this is this is not a claim that the BERT authors are making, by the way. The BERT authors are not saying that different model, different levels of the model are um, capturing different types of uh, information and different layers of the grammar. Uh, so I definitely agree that different parts of the model are capturing different types of information. I, again, I would need, I think I would need additional information um, to really convince me that there is a hierarchy um, intrinsic in the model, if that makes sense. Uh, our results also suggest avenues for further work. Uh, one open question is, to what extent can the quality of BLM representations be improved by simply scaling up model size or data size? For that, read the GPT-2 paper. Uh, as our results have shown, the com computationally efficient architectures also learn high quality representations. One natural direction would be exploring a very large model, language model and data regime, which has happened since. Uh, Leonardo says, so in figure three, they perform the task only with the specific layer. I thought it was all the layers up to that layer. So I think that figure four is the specific layer. And I, each panel shows all layers with the first of top to bottom, four layer, da, da, da. Uh, probing information stored in context layers. Each panel shows results for all layers. Oh, so this must be by individual layer. Okay, I think I might have gotten that backwards. Um, yeah, I also thought it was up to that layer, but from this, it seems like it might be the specific layer. Um, let's go check section 5.1. Uh, how did you actually, uh, focusing in particular, we seem to understand experiments, representation, uh, the network depth. Um, First considering, da, 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 da. how did you do this? Uh, all right, uh, nearest neighbor using cosine similarity or a popular way to visualize. Okay, and this is the this is this uh, T SNE uh, span representations syntactic vectors. Da, 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 da. Okay, so five point three is actually probably going to be more relevant. Uh, probing contextual information to NLP tasks, each model layer. Okay, yeah, so they are looking at each layer independently. All right, thank you. That was a helpful question. Uh, yeah, so the sort of like the the next step of what did we do it bigger, we sort of know. Um, it works well for some tasks and not for others. Uh, despite their success, BLM representations are far from perfect. During training, they have access only to surface forms of words and their order, meaning deeper linguistic phenomena must be learned tabula rasa. Um, so you don't have things like um, uh, lemmatization. Um, so knowing that um, R was, is, being, all of those words are uh, forms of the word to be. Um, so you don't have information about sort of that different uh, words have the same surface form. Um, you don't have information about sense disambiguation. So river bank versus bank where you put your money, you can't necessarily, um, like there's no a priori information given to the model that those are different words. Uh, infusing models with explicit syntactic structure or other linguistic motivated inductive biases may overcome some of the limitations of sequential biomes. An alternate direction, an alternate direction for future work combines the purely unsupervised BLM training objective with existing annotated resources in a multitask or semi-supervised learning, uh, semi-supervised manner. And this is sort of what, what BERT is doing. 
or how BERT can be applied is that you have your your unsupervised BLM model and then you do um, sort of like additional uh, specific training on top of it. Okay, is there an appendix? There's no appendix, we read it. Um, so hopefully those of you who are, who are still with me uh, have sort of been, been following along for a while. Um, I think this is a really interesting paper. Um, I enjoyed reading it. I think it was well written. Uh, I definitely agree with their sort of general finding that lower level grammatical information is captured in the lower levels of the models. Um, and they have pretty compelling evidence for that. So I'm down, I'm down for that. Um, uh, this figure in particular, I think, is pretty pretty compelling, um, showing that lower layers for lower level grammatical tasks, uh, middle layers for things that are sort of phrasal level, and then higher layers for things that are more discourse um, or, or cross-sentential level. Um, that, I think, is pretty compelling. Uh, for me to really buy in that this is that their models have learned the hierarchical relationships between things at different levels of the grammar. Um, again, I would want to see something like, and I know this is like nonsense from a machine learning standpoint, uh, but something like shuffling the layers, uh, the order of the layers, um, assuming that you do that you are learning feature-based things so having like a, a layer that can score stand on your own you're arguing okay this is the pure the, these layers so maybe like these four together this is the part of speech module uh, and maybe these three together these are the constituency parsing module uh, and if we take these and use them together um, they tend to work pretty well and if we do something like change the the order that they happen in so that you're doing constituency parsing feature extraction uh, before you do part of speech tagging in as far as the models are doing these tasks um, you get bad results and it doesn't work as well um, so that's something that I would be be interested in and I don't I don't necessarily know that I think that that would torpedo their models, um, especially because, so the, the language modeling they're arguing is happening in the upper layers of their, their, their model, which is sort of the most general, um, most general task, right? Um, or sort of like the, the largest span task. And we know from other results, um, especially the bird stuff that we were talking about, that you can use language models as sort of your lowest embedding layer. And it works fine. It works pretty good, actually. Um, so I'm, I think this is a really interesting empirical finding. Um, I want more evidence that there's sort of like a theoretical um, claim about the nature of information processed and used um, by models and that by these models in particular. So the LSTMs, the uh, gated CNNs, and the um, uh, the transformer. I believe they used a transformer, right? It's been a while since we read this first bit. Uh, yeah, and the transformer. Um, I would want to see additional evidence that suggests that this is actually hierarchical and that there is some sort of, um, you know, like, like parrots can talk, right? Uh, but parrots can make the sounds that human vocal cords can make. Um, and we look at them and we, we listen to them and we're like, oh yeah, the parrot's talking, they must understand what they're saying. But the, the belief that they have um, sort of like a deep semantic knowledge and sort of have this um, deeper understanding of language in the way that we do is something that's kind of projected. Um, and we don't have a lot of evidence that and I'm getting into animals here. We don't have a lot of evidence that animals can do things like co-reference resolution um, or constituency parsing. We have a lot of evidence that humans can do this very well, but we don't have a lot of evidence for animals. Um, and I think that there's sort of a, a sort of like a, a anthropomorphizing tendency that's like, oh, it sort of looks like it's doing the thing that we do. It must be doing the same thing that we do. Um, and I think it's a very natural human desire to want to um, see patterns of our own behavior and understanding of the world in other things. Um, and I don't, I don't think that like the, this paper was written in bad faith or anything, but I do personally want more evidence before we say things like, 
um, and they are not making this claim. Uh, but before we say things like neural networks learn the same um, structure of information and have the same sort of hierarchical understanding of language that humans do. Anyway, that's my soapbox. Uh, and AJ says, can sparse transformers be covered sometime in the future? Yeah, so um, we finished this paper. So next week we will start on a new paper. One sec. Um, so I am flying to Cleveland for uh, PyCon next week. And I think my flight might be on Wednesday. <laughs> Let me double check. Um, okay, it's not on that calendar. Look on this calendar. Uh, I don't want to say I'm going to be here if I'm not going to be here. OK, no, my flight is on Thursday. So I will be back next Wednesday. Um, I'm looking at a couple papers. Um, so the Sparse Transformers paper is one. Um, a couple people also messaged me on Twitter suggesting other ones. Um, and I will do a vote on my Twitter. That's RC Tatman. Um, and I will give you guys like a choice of three or four papers um, and I'll have you pick which one that you want. And I think I can also do a vote on YouTube maybe. I'll try and figure it out. I'm, I'm still learning all the YouTube like social media stuff. Um, yeah, so Sparse Transformers will definitely be an option. And if a lot of people want to learn about it, we can definitely, definitely learn about it. Um, I was actually just reading about them this morning. It seems really interesting. Um, so it does sort of the things that I would currently use just sort of a vanilla RNN for really well. So things like sequence production um, or um, sequence prediction, sorry, not production. I guess also maybe production if you're if you're interested. Um, so it's definitely something I'm, I'm interested in. Um, also, I'm just sort of interested in transformers because it's this new this new model architecture that seems to be working pretty well for some things, but not for others. And um, I really want to learn more about it because I think it's new and interesting and an important development in the field. All right. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, I will be back on Friday at four and or maybe nine maybe 9 a.m. We'll see. Um, I will definitely be back on Friday. We will be doing the um, second code review for the just the really beefy uh, Python notebook that is uh, looking at unbalanced classes in churn prediction. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I'll, I will announce if that's going to be at 4 p.m. Pacific or 9 a.m. Pacific. Um, and I know that 9 a.m. is better for a lot of folks. And I happen to have this Friday free. So I might do a little little time switch this week just to, to make things a little bit more um, convenient for folks. Um, yep. Yeah, so I will talk to you guys on Friday or uh, on, on Kaggle. You know, I'm, I'm always on the forums. Um, I, I, even if I don't reply, I, I always read everything. So. Uh, and I will see you guys later. Thanks for joining. I hope this was helpful and uh, talk to you guys later. Bye.